Good evening, and a good evening, uh, spectator, subscribers, viewers, friends, and others. I'm Douglas Murray, uh, the associate editor at The Spectator in London, and it's an enormous pleasure uh, to be able to join with so many of you this evening live, uh, virtually, but still live, and uh, for this very special Spectator event. Uh, I'd like to thank Natalie and all the events team for being able to uh, bring this evening together and thank all of you, first of all, for joining us. Uh, let me say a very quick amount before I introduce our guest tonight, uh, a little bit of housekeeping, which uh, is necessary in this era as in any other. Uh, um, uh, our guest and I are going to speak for around 40 minutes and then have time for about 20 minutes of questions and answers uh, from uh, you uh, at home. And I've got a technical note that uh, I've got to inform you all about, which is that there are two ways in which you can send in questions. And this is very important, should, should anything we say stimulate you to uh, think of questions. Uh, the first is that you can type uh, your question in the text on the site. Now, I'm told that this is, this is extremely obvious, um, and I suppose we'll see. But apparently there's a there's a question you can you can just type it on the site and there's a clear uh, place to do that. The other uh, possibility, if if like me, that sounds slightly terrifying and not as obvious as it seems, uh, you can also uh, ask a question by emailing, and you can email events at spectator.co.uk. That's events at spectator.co.uk, and I'll remind you of that later as well, just in case you're all being shy and uh, no one sends in any questions. Uh, but uh, without any further ado, I'd like to talk uh, about briefly about our guest for this evening. Uh, a couple of years ago, when our editor at The Spectator, Fraser Nelson, asked if I would do the occasional event and um, have some friends and, uh, um, and people I uh, admire, uh, to talk with for these events. Uh, we had uh, a first event, an amazing event, some of you will remember, many of you have been at with Roger Scruton uh, in Westminster. We had another event with Lionel Shriver. And uh, this event uh, tonight, I would love to be able to do live, uh, but it's it's uh, as, as good as we can get, and it's going to be amazing uh, to be with uh, our guest tonight. Uh, Ayan Hersi Ali needs, I think, very little introduction. Uh, for most people. She has a remarkable life story. She's a remarkable woman. I'm very proud to have been able to call her a friend for something coming on uh, two decades. Um, she's written numerous books, including her life story in the best-selling uh, books, Infidel and Nomad. Uh, she's most recently the author of a new book called Prey, uh, Immigration, Islam, and the erosion of women's rights. And we're gonna talk about that a bit tonight, but uh, without any, uh, any further ado, I just want to be able to say welcome to Ayan uh, on behalf of all of us at The Spectator and what an enormous pleasure it is to see you. It's a great pleasure to see you, uh, Douglas. Wonderful to be with you. Unfortunately, it's virtual, but we'll correct for that soon. We will indeed. So let's, let's start off. There's a lot that we can cover tonight. Um, but let's start off with Prey. Um, I remember some time ago when you, you, you uh, mentioned to me that you were thinking of doing a, a book in this area. And I remember um, making a whistling like noise, I think, because uh, I thought I've always admired your ability to go where uh, angels fear to tread. Um, but uh, this this really struck me from the moment you mentioned it as 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 really treading into the one of the most difficult, contentious, argued over subjects imaginable. So perhaps you could just lay out a little bit about what the book's about and then how you decided to write it and, and, and what, what what kicked you off. Well, I mean, I honestly have to say I wasn't ready for a controversy and I'm not. Uh, and I didn't um, write this book with the intention of uh, inciting a controversy, mm. but generating a conversation about something very important that's going on. And you're absolutely right when it comes to the issues of immigration, Islam um, and women's rights. All of these issues are volatile. Uh, people are feel very passionately about these things and generally there is a sense that uh, it's best to avoid these topics mm -hmm. um, but the subject of prey is that women 
in Europe, in the public space, and when I talk about women, I'm talking about all women, not just immigrant women or local women, all of them, um, have seen an increase in their safety in the public space, which is very different from the private space. And uh, this is an increase of violence against women, sexual violence. And a lot of this is perpetrated by immigrant men. And that is why the topic is, it, it, it's, uh, you know, volatile to be because you just having any kind of conversation about immigration is just hard enough. Uh, and then on top of that, most of these immigrant men come from Muslim majority countries where they have different attitudes to women. And when you have all of that together, and there were events in different parts of Europe, mainly in Germany and Austria, but also in Sweden, in Denmark, in France, and obviously also in the United Kingdom. Uh, I was reading a lot of well, anecdotal evidence on the media, social media. Um, a friend of mine went and did a deep dive investigative journalism type of story in Austria. And she concluded, she came away with all, oh, most of the perpetrators are from Afghanistan. And this is something that's happening in Austria. And I thought, no, 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 no. It's happening everywhere. And it's not just men from Afghanistan. It's men from Iraq and Syria, from Somalia, from Eritrea, from Nigeria, from Ghana. Um, and it's, it's very important if we want uh, the immigration process and especially the integration process to succeed, to address some of the negative and unintended consequences. And that's why I did this book. I mean, uh, there are several things that I wanted to ask about this because one is, of course, you immediately enter, among other things, a statistical and evidential nightmare. Yes. Uh, uh, because uh, it seems to me, I mean, you, and you tread it with enormous aplomb in the book. Um, you're actually dealing with an issue in prey that every European government is trying not to find out about. Uh, so, you know, as you know, the, the stats that you find are effectively hidden away in the data. Um, the evidence isn't collected, it seems. You know, you have to go and dig for yourself about it. How, how did you go about all of that? Well, uh, first of all, obviously, I started by uh, calling the formal agencies, government agencies, whose job it is to collect this data. So various uh, parts of the ministries of justice and ministries of in the interior. And many of them are very quick to say, yes, we do have data on sexual violence, but we don't collect any kind of data on ethnicity, on religion, country of origin, nationality, all of these features. Uh, we just can't do it. And in some cases, on an informal way, they would say, that has to do with the history of, for instance, Germany and the Second World War and the experience uh, of the Jews and uh, because of that type of uh, systemic and systematic persecution that led to the Holocaust, uh, we, we just simply don't collect that data. So I thought, okay, maybe I'll get it from the newspapers and some of the mainstream uh, editorial newspapers, TVs and so on, they said that they had press norms uh, that were uh, imposed on them, on, on the journalists doing the reporting to say, you know, a man of Asian origin or of Middle mm. Eastern, origin, and that's what they used to write, but now they don't even write that anymore. So they would just write the first name of the perpetrator or the person of the suspect mm. and then have an initial as the last name. Uh, but uh, honestly, even with the first names, it's quite clear uh, mm. where, when a name is local and when a name is foreign. Um, but aside from that, I also started having interviews. I looked uh, for court cases. I looked for victims and had interviews with them. And then I started talking to the local people. And uh, I found not every country is the same. In some countries, they do actually collect data and have gone, some of these governments have decided that it wasn't worthwhile uh, to hide disinformation from the public. Uh, Denmark mm. is one such country, but also Austria, because of just the sheer number of attacks that they've had to deal with. So uh, everything that I have found, I document in Prey. And uh, when you read Prey, you're not going to walk away with a causal relationships here. I'm, I'm trying to be very, very careful. But you do have a very clear correlation. Um, and, uh, you know, 
as you go uh, through the pages, you are going to see that every institution uh, is trying to find the right way for this, but as either being good or bad, mostly bad uh, mm. for a reason. For instance, if you take the institution of media, they're damned if they report because they're accused of empowering the far right and populist parties, but they're also damned if they don't, because if they don't, then uh, they end up, you know, as, as citizens, you end up going uh, to social media for your news or yeah. Russian for unreliable news sources as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, unreliable news sources that tell lies or exaggerate the issue. So in any case, that is the challenge for the media. Uh, I've spoken to members of the police, various police forces, and they would say they would love nothing more than to just do their job. Mm. But very often they're told by senior officials to drop a case or not to investigate or not to write down uh, the names. And, and that in that sense, they find that they're letting down the victims. And then you have the entire court system, which really wasn't designed for this type of thing, for a heterogeneous society where people would be coming from broken down societies uh, where violence is, uh, the threshold for violence is low. So, uh, I mean, there, very often I've been asked, well, we admit that there is a problem. Yes, we have a rise of sexual violence against women and we know that it's perpetrated mostly by immigrant men, but what would you like us to do? And so there's this shrugging it off of, we've got to live with it. And an effect of that has been that for many women, especially in working class neighborhoods, because that's where the negative effects of immigration is felt the most. It is in working class neighborhoods, working class places. Um, some of these women have decided to act like the women in the countries of origin, where they decide to think twice about whether to go out in the first place and what to wear, whether they should go up in larger numbers. Some of them have been buying pepper spray and trying to arm themselves in various ways, uh, but their freedom of uh, movement is constrained and their safety is limited, and that is wrong. It's not just an erosion of women's rights, it's an erosion of the rule of law. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing, this, this, this where um, such an extraordinary um, event can be constantly happening, and every agency in the country, including the media, uh, gets stuck in this sort of um, impossible situation, it seems to be in their eyes. I remember when I was when I was researching the strange death of Europe uh, in Germany in 2015 and 2016, uh, I remember uh, speaking to Germans who said to me, you know, we we think that whenever, it, it, well, the first thing was they said the, the whole thing about using Asian as, as the term was just at the beginning was very confusing. It sort of suggested that there was a sort of Chinese rape problem in parts of Germany, which, you know, it, it, this term means different things in different places. And, and it seemed to be almost willfully obfuscating. And then you had the problem that was described to me that if you didn't describe anything about the ethnic origin uh, or the name, and you simply had, as some, uh, some particularly in the German media would do, they sort of say, well, last night a thing happened to a person in a place. Yes. And, and people would actually just assume that that must be a migrant. Yes. And uh, in other words, the less the press tells, the worse perhaps the population think the things are because they're having to read the yeah. news through this filter of not being told anything and coming to their own conclusions. And that actually feeds into conspiracy theories because people start to believe anything. And uh, if you look into the motives of why some of these institutional leaders are hiding or trying to obfuscate things, it's well intended. Mm. Um, it is to preserve social cohesion and it is to prevent prejudice against immigrants, because obviously not all immigrants are perpetrators of sexual violence and not all men from Muslim majority countries engage in this type of terrible behavior. But I think in many ways, because of this obfuscation, we just end up with exactly the opposite effect, which is the breakdown of social cohesion where groups of different um, communities of ethnic backgrounds and religious backgrounds are constantly suspicious of one another. Mm. And so I don't, I really think it is counterproductive and it's much better to have to be very open and honest about these things. But Douglas, as you know, and I think we're going to go into it, the backdrop for all of this 
in uh, the decade we live in now, but also in uh, the previous decade and even the decade before that, is this emergence of identity politics, of looking at individual citizens of various countries, not as individuals, but as members of different uh, communities that are supposed to be or are seen by the ideologues as hostile to one another, oppressors mm -hmm. and oppressed. So I think this, this is primarily the reason why uh, we are having a lot of problems in trying to just bring into the open developments within our societies that need urgent attention and very often governmental attention, but are being ignored. And, uh, and then these problems just get bigger and bigger. And, uh, and these agencies, I think they do, uh, they're not held accountable. Uh, you, you know very well, and I think the British public knows the story of the Pakistani grooming gangs. Uh, if, you, if, if early on, uh, 20 years or so ago, if the police, the social workers, all the people whose job it was to protect those children had acted uh, responsibly and had helped and just done their jobs uh, and had helped these children, these young girls, then I think we wouldn't have had these runaway networks and these men would not be in prison. And so in hindsight, you can see why the decisions that were made to do nothing actually uh, were wrong and I don't know as far as I can tell but you maybe you can tell me this has anyone in any of those institutions been held accountable no they, they, they're almost none or at least there's no serious accountability uh when operation bullfinch happened in Oxfordshire which I mean I mean there's a sort of tendency as you know in, in the sort of grooming gangs and rape gangs discussion to sort of assume it only happens in the north of England which is itself a sort of excuse for not paying attention you know, it's just places like Rotherham and Rochdale. It's sort of dismissed by the particularly southern uh, um, uh, media class as something that happened elsewhere. Well, well, Operation Bullfinch was in Oxfordshire. It was a grooming gang of, of uh, immigrant men uh, um, raping girls in the Oxfordshire area. And uh, after that came to light, and the, the court case and the convictions of, of, of a large number of men occurred, um, uh, the, the head of the... the I think it was child services at Oxfordshire District Council uh, gave a video apology and you would have thought she was apologizing for sort of leaves on the line in a train journey. No, she said, we're very sorry for the breakdown of services that occurred in, in Oxfordshire. You're talking about a situation where, for instance, girls tried to escape men who were gang raping them, got back to the, the hostelry where they were in, and were sent back to the gangs because the people in charge of the hostel wouldn't pay the taxi fare. You know, that was just one of the stories from it that you know about. It's absolutely horrific. And right. to hear the uh, um, one of the people responsible for this just outrage, uh, uh, um, giving this sort of pathetic bureaucraties apology really was one of the things that made me most angry about this. Before, before we move on, by the way, to the identity policy, let me just raise a couple of other things quickly, which is, I think the identity of the victims is a very important thing in this as well, because as it were, the identity politics of talking about the perpetrators is one thing, but there seems to be a sort of issue about the identity of the victims in these cases, the women in Cologne uh, from New Year's Eve, um, and particularly the, the well, it turns out thousands uh, of victims in towns across England. Um, you just tell us something about that because it's very striking to me. But just before you do, let me just throw out one other story, which is uh, um, some years ago. I remember Mark Stein told me he was thinking about writing a book in 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 this area, and and mm -hmm. um, actually he said it was such a depressing subject to look into. He just sort of couldn't bear it, among other things, you know. Um, but he said one thing that always haunted me on this. He said, as he went round England speaking to some of the girls who were the victims, he had the impression that they would be sort of talked out, you know, the Rotherham victims, the Rochdale victims, the Telford victims. And he said it, it, it was quite the opposite. Uh, they, t they kept telling him things like, you're the first person who's come and asked me what happened. You're the first journalist I've spoken to. And I always thought that was, that was so haunting and shaming that mm -hmm. that would be the case. But the identity of the victim seems to be a major component. Um, 
I, I have found that also in different countries that uh, the identity of the victims in this case. So I'm in, in the book, it's a documenting of sexual violence against what they call strangers. So the perpetrator and the victim do not know one another, it's random. And some of the perpetrators act uh, as individuals, but very often as groups of two, three, four or more. And there are two things that strike me and struck me about the identity of the victims. Uh, one is the prejudice that the perpetrators hold against white girls. Uh, they deem them to be in, uh, indecent, uh, not virtuous, not modest, and uh, up for grabs. So that is the prejudice that the immigrant men who engage in this uh, in these sexual violence acts, they have that prejudice against these girls. The other type of prejudice is class. Mm. And I know that in the UK, uh, it's much more common to talk about class differences. But in many European countries, there is a sense that, oh, we are so equal and egalitarian. We have absolutely no class issue. I think that is a lie because indeed, if the victim happens to be a girl of middle class where the parents uh, educate, have a college education, university education, uh, and uh, or a higher income, the outrage generally seems to be more widespread. It's carried by the newspapers and television stations and so on. And then uh, local officials, law enforcement and government officials are forced to do something about the problem or pretend to do something about the problem. But when it is in working class neighborhoods, and again, I repeat, they do carry the biggest burden when it comes to the negative and unintended consequences of immigration. Mm -hmm. It is that class factor has, is one that has to be looked into. And uh, what I also thought was fascinating was anywhere where there is any kind of feminism, you know, organized groups of women who say that they are there to fight for the rights of women. This is mostly middle class. It's mostly about getting women into positions of power uh, on boards, uh, shattering right. the glass ceiling, um, finding some kind of balance between home life and working life. Th that, those are the priorities. It's not the priorities of uh, safety in the public space, in working class neighborhoods and transport hubs and that sort of thing. So yes, there's very much a class issue here that's not been looked into. And that's, yes, and yes. That's such a fascinating point, Ayan, because uh, I think the historians would look back on this era and think, you know, what were the feminists uh, um, campaigning about most vociferously in that era? And if you notice the, the vast number of cases you talk about in your book across Europe, the way in which there seemed to be an ignoring of the problem or just an unfamiliarity, at best an unfamiliarity with the problem, uh, it strikes me as something that people are going to look back at with bafflement. And what's more, as, as you well know, as you bring out in prey, in an era where, where in every other situation, claiming that a woman was, as it were, asking for it, yeah. is completely unacceptable. For a brief period, yes, it was the case that as a woman, you were not held responsible for the misconduct of uh, the male perpetrator in Europe and in the United States of America, at least that was a milestone that feminists had reached, which was, mm. it doesn't matter what she's wearing, it doesn't matter whether she's drunk or not, it doesn't matter if she's in the wrong place, you are not supposed to commit the crime. And here, uh, in, in the stories that I tell in uh, Prey, uh, these women have all said the exact same thing. No one actually listens to them at all. And very often these victims would say to me, I want to tell you my story, but before I tell you my story, I want to make it very clear that I'm not um, political. I have no right-wing connections. In fact, I've always voted for social Democrat or center left parties. And I want immigrants to come here and I want them to flourish. I want them to thrive. I just wanted them to stop this crime. This is what the victims are saying. Now, when it comes to social democratic parties, center-left parties, I think they have abandoned their constituencies. 
And these women are in fact their constituencies and uh, they, these women have nowhere to go at this point. And the only, I think the only way out would be for them, the women themselves to start forming their own organizations. Um, and interestingly, the only other group of women who were very, very vocal about this issue were immigrant women, survivors of honor violence and survivors of, uh, you know, women who felt that their families were imposing Islamist views on them uh, to cover themselves and stay at home and marry someone that they didn't want according to Sharia. Women who survived these things in the various countries while the women were out in front saying, look what's happening. The more you bring men from Muslim majority countries, the more our neighborhoods are affected. The social control is more severe. And uh, we are seeing these problems almost like it's back home from the countries, you know, from North Africa or the Middle mm. East of Asia or uh, various parts of Africa. So I think that there, there is an opportunity perhaps for working class women and immigrant women to form some kind of movement and fight this, because I don't think these uh, center left parties are interested in in their um, in their interests anymore. Uh, mm. These parties are now driven by identity politics. So it's things like skin color, as you know, and religion and Islamophobia and other, you know, very trendy sounding causes. Well, let, let's get on to that because um, I, I regard you as being um, one of the most acute observers as well as one of the bravest observers of the scene uh, in the West in particular, perhaps at the moment. And, um, and I wondered, uh, you know, having followed your career very closely for many years, I wondered what you think now looking out at the situation in, in America, in Britain, across Europe, um, you've, you've got an, a great eagle eye for spotting the things that people aren't daring to talk about, but should. Uh, um, wh what, are the one, what are the ones that are on your mind at the moment? <laughs> well, to be honest with you, it is what everyone has now been talking about for quite some time, which I, I was not in the least eagle-eyed towards. I, in fact, dismissed uh, cancel culture, critical race theory, critical justice theory, all this identity politics stuff. I, you know, while I dismissed it as as a fad and I thought it was something that was just in universities and as soon as these students graduated and uh, got in touch with the real world that they would shag them because the real world would teach them. I didn't expect this thing to expand out of these colleges and into the wider society, into corporations, the government, everywhere else. But I do see um, that there are these connections where, you know, if you ignore the constraining of free speech and academic freedom in the universities, and then you ignore it again, or, or you succumb to it, you submit to it in the, um, elementary and high school education. And then right now what we're seeing in the United States is that the government itself, various governmental departments are imposing this uh, critical race theory uh, features on employees, on government employees. And the same is happening with uh, corporations. I think in, in the long run, it's very easy to see how you know the, the minds of Americans can be closed. And I wanted to ask you, in fact, I know that there is a similar struggle going on in the UK, perhaps not as dramatic as here in, in the US. Mm. But I, I wanted to ask you, how is it in the UK, because we are in a very, very bad position here in America, from what I can see. Yeah, no, I, I think you're certainly right about that. I mean, I spend a certain amount of my time there in America and notice these these trends there. I mean, it's, it's odd, isn't it, the way that these sorts of um, um, these things that one hesitates to use the term virus about this, but these sort of thought viruses sort of transfer between the continents, it seems to me. Now, I mean, there are certain things that we know well about in Europe, about, for instance, Islamist extremism, which America is sort of a, a bit behind on some of it, I would say. Um, but then you get the things like the uh, the sort of um, council culture, uh, the term I don't particularly like, but also, you know, obviously the identity politics of the critical race theory and more. And that that's just flooded out of America uh, straight to the UK and elsewhere. Readers of, of The Spectator uh, well, now I mentioned some of this in my column this week, uh, where 
Um, you know, institution after institution keeps deciding that since the death of George Floyd at the hands of a Minnesotan policeman who's now in prison, uh, they have to change everything about their institution. You know, whether it's the the National Trust or the uh, uh, or Norwich Town Hall last week, or uh, everyone's got Kew Gardens recently announced that uh, that uh, botanical uh, gardens were uh, um, racist. Um, uh, and uh, and then we had the Royal Academy of Music the other day. I mean, it's denied it since, but it said it was going to decolonize its instrument collection, its collection of ancient instruments. Uh, as I said in the Spectator, I think George Floyd would have been surprised to have heard uh, that uh, his his uh, killing was going to lead to a purge of harpsichords in London. But but it seems to have just washed across the entire culture. It's a fascinating thing that. And um, but, but America is the absolute um, source of this. It's um, it's patient zero on this, and it is stunning to me the speed with which it's spilled out. But you've seen you've seen uh, you've seen this up close. Well, yes. First, if you go, you know, to the roots of it, these postmodernist philosophers came from France, and then I think they were cultivated here in various American universities in places where they they have gender studies and race studies and all sorts of. Uh, you know, either seemingly innocent uh, things that people want uh, to focus on, or in some cases, I mean, I looked at gender studies and I always think when you have a degree in gender studies, what are you going to do uh, afterwards? But uh, so it seemed kind of contained mm. and eccentric in these places, but now it's become, uh, it, it's a big deal. And yeah. what, I think the, the um, the effects that we're seeing is uh, it, it, it's caused by groups like the strident inflexible transgender activists uh, where of course it's very understandable that they say they want equal rights for transgender people and they want these people to be recognized which is one thing but when there are unintended consequences like young children being lured uh, through the internet into undergoing physiological changes that are dramatic and you know cannot be reversed and we can't have a conversation about that when the healthcare professionals are too terrified and just go along with that mm. women's prisons now uh, you know we have just passed the law in california and this just tells you how crazy things are that if you you don't have to undergo any kind of process to become female or male, you just have to say, I identify as such. And so male prisoners, male convicts are claiming to be female and no mm. one is allowed to ask any question. They're being housed with women. And uh, here now these men are being abusive towards these women and no one is listening to these women. You know, we are seeing things like that. Uh, we're seeing the entire education system where children as young as six or seven or eight years old are being told if they're white, that they're oppressors, which in my book is just pure child abuse because why on earth would you be telling a six year or seven, eight, nine year, eight, nine year old that they're oppressors and they're responsible for all these heavy history. And then uh, the children of color are being told that they're victims. Uh, and again, in its own way, that's also a form of abuse because these children are being told they have no agency. Everything that happens to them that is negative is as a consequence of something that white people do. Uh, and this is now becoming the standard curriculum. And so I'm seeing mm. around a lot of parents who are saying that they're either going to leave the country or homeschool or start their own schools. Um, and then in government, people are being uh, subjected to these so-called mandatory uh, 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 unconscious bias trainings uh, and this is just really an ideological indoctrination and the policing of what people think uh, mm -hmm. so it, it, here it's it's crazy it's it's going out of control uh, let me let me ask you a couple of things before before we bring in uh, audience questions and just to remind the audience there are these two two techniques for uh, for sending in questions uh, one of them is to send it in on apparently the extremely obvious box on your screen, and the other is to email at, uh, events at spectator.co.uk. Uh, before we get to audience questions, let me just a couple of things. Uh, the first is, um, 
I'd love your thoughts on this. What do you what, what do you make of this? And this touches on, on on a number of the things we've spoken about. Tonight. What do you make of the way in which um, identity seems to be sort of transferable, depending not just on the identity of the speaker, but on the specific words they use. So that, for instance, um, uh, some people who are not white are allowed to voice their opinions, and indeed, told, everyone's told to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, and other people who happen not to be white are told to shut up because they're not saying helpful things in some ways. Uh, this seems to have been rife in America. I wonder if you've got any views on that. Um, it's and it's not just in America. It has now also come to Europe. Yes, but if you are black or of you know Indian origin or if you're non-white, yes, uh, it seems that at first what you say if it diverges from uh, the ideology, people might listen. But after that, really, Douglas, even then you are dismissed as, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm a proponent of the free market, obviously, with protections of again, the unintended consequences of the free market. Um, I believe in individual freedom and individual responsibility and accountability. These things are now called whiteness and racist. I believe that people should actually try and pick themselves up by their bootstraps first, uh, if possible, and only afterwards ask for help. All of these things are now regarded as whiteness. Uh, we are told that punctuality is whiteness, that mathematics, objective truth is whiteness. And uh, there are obviously a lot of people who are not white who object to that and say it, it's just absurd. And what does that mean? What mm. does that make me as as black person or person of color? Does that make me? Is it just I'm lazy? I can't read the time. Uh, I can't plan for the future. Uh, my merit is to be questioned only because of my skin color. So you see how it is sort of a subtle racism that goes on. Yeah. Uh, but if you wait, 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 wait. sorry, go on. Go on. Well, no. I was going to ask one other follow on from that before I come to some excellent audience questions coming in. But perhaps you can help me with one question I've really had in recent years about this is why can you now predict with 100% certainty uh, uh, the views that a certain type of public figure is going to have uh, on a range of issues? I think, let me give you throw two examples out there. Um, Ilan Omar, a famous uh, congresswoman, I think, from Somalia, I think, originally, isn't she? Yes. yes. Um, uh, 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 when she was in office for a very brief amount of time, uh, wrote to the local sports authorities uh, in her district complaining that they wouldn't allow somebody who was born a man to win the women's weightlifting competition. Uh, and in no ordinary way would I, you expect Ilan Omar, who holds pretty strict views uh, of her Islamic background, to be standing up for the big bearded man winning the women's weightlifting competition. But there it is. And the second example that springs to mind is um, uh, AOC, another uh, famous uh, um, young congresswoman, who um, in her first weeks in office did a fundraiser for the very, very controversial charity Mermaids, which seeks to uh, help uh, children in the UK transition. You think, why would AOC be interested in, in, in raising thousands of pounds for a children transitioning uh, group in the UK? Well, that's because it's part of the ideology. And I don't know when, at one point, at what point uh, these internal contradictions are going to come about. But in, in the case of Ilhan Omar, uh, there's the, the Islamists and the, uh, the woke ideologues are united in the hate of America in the hate of individualism, in the hate of accountability, in the hate of Israel, and in their anti-Semitism. And so in many ways, they, they, they have common ground in all of these things. Uh, now, AOC and her interest in the transgender community, I, I don't know, I don't know much about that. But I do know that part of this, um, you know, the erasing of uh, sex and gender it's part of the woke ideology. There are no women, there are no men, it's all fluid. There are a hundred genders or more. I mean, I sometimes ask why I stop at a hundred, you could just say <clears throat> it's a hundred, somewhat limiting if you think about it. Yeah. 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 Um, the, um... That's, these are some of the, you know, 10 commandments or whatever the religious mm. orthodoxy, ideological, you know, ideological orthodoxy. So I do see where they see common ground, but I think it mm. is for us on the outside, to poke at their contradictions and to demand really, uh, you know, if you're a proponent of Sharia, 
and then what are your views on the rights of women and all on the LGBT community on and Jewish community and so it, it, it's for the outsiders uh, to keep asking mm. these questions, uh, but unfortunately, they do not want to debate. Coleman Hughes, who is a friend mm. and uh, uh, a black man, uh, uh, he invited Ibram X. Kendi, who's one of the living prophets of this uh, uh, this uh, critical race theory. I call it now criminal race theory. <laughs> And uh, he, he invited uh, Ibram X. Kendi to debate. He will not respond. Yeah. I did Robin D'Angelo to come and debate with me. She will not. They will not debate because mm. they are not ready to defend uh, their beliefs and their ideas. They just want to impose mm. it on others. And that really, really makes them into much more of a religious movement um, than a political movement. Yeah, well, I, I have to say, um, uh, I think I know why they won't. I, I know Coleman and, and I know why Ibrahim X. Kendi won't debate him, which is that Coleman would make mincemeat of Kendi. And I know why Robin D'Angelo won't debate you, which is that you'd make mincemeat of her. So so on a personal uh, career level, they're very sensible to keep away and uh, typically disingenuous of them to do so. But let, let, let's go to some questions. Uh, we've got a lot of them have come in. Uh, um, here's a very interesting one from Amir. Um, is there any other option, Amir asks, than either government and law enforcement doing what we pay them to do, or a Tommy Robinson persona leading the charge against predators? Well, in my book, I think that law enforcement uh, should do their job because, you know, we have governments where, that have the monopoly of violence and we pay taxes first and foremost so that the government can protect its citizens uh, from external forces and also from domestic harm. And so I think it is key, very important that we do hold government accountable for that. Now, the Tony Robinsons of this world, ideally you would not want the Tony Robinsons of this world to be the voice of women's emancipation. But what you want is for those voices where, you know, where there is, uh, um, where there is harm and, and the individuals, the victims, when they voice that harm, you, you want them to be listened to. And they, they've always been in Europe, uh, groups and organizations and individuals that articulate particular interests. And we touched on feminism and the feminist movements and organizations don't seem to be interested in this or in, they may have made a trade-off where they think it's far more important to them to protect mm. um, the sentiments of uh, the immigrant community rather than women's rights. These are, these are you know, personal choices and organizational choices that they've made that are wrong. But as you said, the question was posed by a person called Anir. I think it's also important that individuals within the communities where the perpetrators come from should come forward and uh, say, we don't want the community name smeared. And the way mm. to, to stop that from happening is not to pretend that there's nothing going on and be offended because we're talking about the problems, but to go after the individuals who are the perpetrators who are engaged in this terrible behavior and stop them. Hmm. Let, me, let me throw another question in. Uh, uh, Paul asks, uh, wokest mobs across the Western world have had great success rewriting the basic tenets of our established history. What are the key factors at work that have made such inroads into our established historical legacy? And what does it say about historians that they have had such an easy ride so far? Now, I hate to say it, but you're married to a historian, of course, and uh, <laughs> don't speak for him, but this is a very interesting question. It is a very interesting question. And yes, I am married to a historian who is very much upset by what's going on and by this erosion of history. And I think part of it is because I, we took it for granted that uh, people who, you know, that these things have been fought and there's not any, anybody who's fighting historians was going to lose. Uh, I think because there was a sense that um, the history departments within universities, the teaching of history in high school and uh, elementary school, that that was a given that these curricula were not controversial at all. Uh, that's one, and I think when we saw the first signs of opposition, uh, many people ignored that development, including historians, and I think historians should take responsibility mm. for that. Um, a lot of these um, institutions were underfunded. 
And then there was this ideological bent where people on the left and perhaps even on the far left were left to do the administration, uh, and, you know, to recruit academics so that I, I don't know very much about the UK uh, because I didn't look into it, but in the United States, almost all things that colleges and universities do uh, is done by uh, the left. I think it was Michael Bloomberg who remarked on it sometime in 2014, 15, where he said something, you know, it was over 95% or 98% of professors at Harvard and most of the Ivy League had given to the Democratic Party. And so in that mm. sense, you see this ideological bent and yeah. lack of balance. And so all of these things, it, 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 I, mean, I think we're just seeing the sudden change, but these things were going on for quite some time. Mm. Then I think we, we confused uh, critical thinking with self-condemnation. It, it's very good to look critically at the history of Western civilization and of the various countries within Western civilization. But it is wrong to condemn it wholeheartedly and to say, you know, the whole thing has just been really awful and it's only a story of oppression, slavery uh, and exploitation. When in fact, that's not the case. Uh, the history of Western civilization is also the story of civilization and emancipation, the emancipation of women, uh, the emancipation of and the abolition of slavery uh, and this quest, relentless quest for equal rights for everyone. So I think that story has to be told before these very naughty people tell us that wokeism is the way out. Mm. By the way, I just add one coda to that, if I may, which is that there's also a technical reason, it seems to me, in the teaching of history, which is that uh, uh, issues like, for instance, empire uh, were unpopular for some time in um, in academic study in the UK, for instance, uh, it, it was almost as if there was a, a realm of knowledge that was that was forgotten. Uh, so much so that when, for instance, you had the Rhodes Must Fall campaign at Oxford, the campaigners were saying things that Cecil Rhodes had said, which he just hadn't said. You know, there are yeah. all sorts of legitimate claims you can make for and against Cecil Rhodes, but they were just making stuff up, and no one seemed to notice until Nigel Bigger of, uh, of Christchurch College looked into it, did what anyone should do, and you know, read the D Dictionary of National Biography entry to start with on Cecil Rhodes and, and found that. The... So it's a very interesting thing that, that, that effectively the, the, the uh, campaigners and others, the defamers, are speaking into a kind of knowledge vacuum where we have a sort of forgotten knowledge or forgotten history, uh, yes. uh, which perhaps perhaps needs to be dug up again. This goes to a number of the questions um, that are coming in. Uh, let me, this is jumping around slightly, there's a fair amount about history, which is very interesting, but maybe we could also go to Helena who asks, uh, why are immigrant women living in Europe not fighting this erosion of rights? First of all, yes. is Helena right and why is it? Yes. So to Helena, there are actually a lot of immigrant women who are fighting it. And I think I said before during our first conversation that, in fact, uh, surprisingly, it is immigrant women uh, who ha have lived in Europe for a number of years, some of them who were born and raised in Europe, who are seeing some of these changes and are fighting it. Uh, but they are not large enough and they're not powerful enough. They don't have the resources. But aside from that, you, uh, immigrant women, especially those from Muslim households, have to deal with the culture at home where as girls, they're pulled out of school. They're subjected to all of these uh, strictures around honor. Uh, you're not allowed to wear makeup, you're not allowed to have a boyfriend, you're not allowed to finish school, you're not allowed to work, you're forced into marriage, all of these things. And the bigger and more conservative or reactionary that community is, the more of a constraint that there is for girls and women. So it is really, really tough on immigrant women in particular to come out because they, don't, they, they have to fight the woke ideology that's trying to label them victim when some of them are really proud survivors. Uh, and, and want what everyone else wants to have. And then you also have, as an immigrant, you have to deal with your family, your extended family, your community that are telling you that you're becoming too westernized, too British or too American or too Swedish or what have you. Uh, and so yeah, it's a very good question, but it's, uh, I think these women are not seen enough and not heard enough. Um, let's go, we've only got time for a couple more questions. Uh, so do keep sending them in. Um, uh, 
This is a, this is one. Uh, I think you're very well placed to uh, to answer, Ayana. Oliver says, in the I think this is said slightly cheekily. I must say, he says, in the spirit of balance, do we need to talk more about the slavery that took place in other parts of the world? Uh, absolutely, please <laughs> let's do. It. And it's not you said took. There is slavery that still takes mm. place. Uh, today in the Middle East, in South Asia, in Africa, where I come from, there are people, when I was growing up in Somalia, who were Somali, at least seen within the nation states, whatever is left of it, Somalia. But these people were forced into labor and they were not paid and they were called slaves. Uh, when I lived in Saudi Arabia, just because of my black skin, Saudis referred to me and my family members as slaves. They still do. There are all sorts of people who go, immigrants who go from uh, various parts of Africa and Asia to work in the Middle East. And those people are treated very, very poorly, close, almost closely. They're not sold and bought, but they're not paid what's due to them. And very often they find that they can't leave those circumstances. Look at human trafficking. Uh, look at uh, the whole sex industry. I mean, they all depend on people who actually can't get out and are forced to do jobs that are awful and that they can't, they didn't ask for. So instead of, you know, being mesmerized and uh, hyper-focused on the slavery of 200 years ago, why don't we talk about the slavery that's going on now? Um, and then again, I want to point out, actually, it is Western civilization. It is the British and the Americans who fought wars to end slavery and who told the story over and over again of why human dignity must stand above uh, uh, you know, religious and ideological notions of inferiority that you, know, you might hold towards other people. And so that story hasn't been told and it should be told. And it can't, you can't really understand it if we're not honest about the history itself. I'm not surprised that people are asking, quite a number of people are asking about history. I really hope that, you know, a large number, large enough number of British people and others stand up and demand that history be, uh, you know, be taught and be taught right and, and, and be taught honestly. We've got time for perhaps one final question. Before we do, can I just throw in one of my own as well, Ayan? I'd love to know your answer to this uh, before we go to a final question from the audience in the remaining few minutes we have. Um, we've been living through, it hasn't come up this evening, um, but uh, we've been living through, all of us, a most uh, extraordinary and unusual period in the last 18 months or so. Uh, it's obviously too early to tell in lots of ways, but do you have any views on, on how us all being forced into our solitude for well over a year in this unprecedented situation will affect some of the issues we're talking about tonight. And if there's other things you see coming down the road as a consequence of this extraordinary time. Well, I think the, the main question in free society is, is, you know, how much power do we hand government? And then what do governments do with that? And governments have to balance between you know, respecting uh, personal liberty and all the other liberties that we have, but also containing this disease and understanding it. And I think in every country, Western country, you see those conversations being had. Um, what kind of effect is this going to have on the conversations that we've been having, for instance, immigration and the negative consequences of immigration, but especially the integration of immigrants into the wider society and what's the role of government in that. And if government does take upon itself that role, then how much of the individual freedoms of immigrants who are to be integrated is going to be sacrificed in the name of that higher good of you know, the outcome. So I think it's, we're living in very, very interesting times, but I think it's legitimate both to say, you know, we, we don't want government compromising our liberty. We also you know, don't want the, economic, the economies to be collateral damage. But at the same time, these governments do have to understand um, and, and, and counter uh, such things as the pandemic. If you, you said that I liked, uh, controversial issues, but I think, for instance, just looking back at your country, do you think in hindsight, 
that an organization like the NHS uh, should have been saddled with this particular emergency. Well, but then you're not allowed to ask such questions because the, the NHS is now sacred. And so, you know, everything goes back to uh, what can we talk about? <laughs> and, <laughs> Quite and so. And honest conversations about, yeah. Um, let me wrap up. There's a, a couple of questions that are, are linked. Um, we both have a shot at them. Um, Marta asks, is the only way forward to speak the truth in our everyday lives rather than using their ideology against the woke. And uh, then um, Sophie says, Douglas and Diane, you have, oh, this is a very nice question, not flattering. She says, you have helped to keep us sane through this culture war madness. <laughs> what do you suggest we do? Okay, you go first, Diane. Let me go with number one and say, uh, because uh, the critical race theory movement, critical justice, theory, the social warriors, their movement, uh, one of their key objectives is to pollute our language, to contaminate the everyday language that we speak to one another. So obviously the most glaring uh, uh, pushback or, 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 or answer to that would be not to allow them to do that so that we just speak plain English. And if English is a second language, in my case, it's a fourth language, you've worked very hard you know, to understand and you're taught grammar and syntax and all that. And suddenly they come around and they introduce this incredibly ugly vocabulary. And so you have to learn their language. And I think language is, is uh, and especially the English language is one of the realms that we have to protect uh, from these people. It's the only way to have honest debates or discussions uh, and conversations and let's not allow them let's not speak their language very clearly yes there are men and women not people who menstruate or uh, all of these adding the letter x to nouns it's just, it's just terrible don't allow them to do that just speak plain english the plainer the simpler the better there's, there's nothing quite like making you feel small than Ayan reminding you that she's speaking in her fourth language. <laughs> I didn't mean to do it, but you know how No, it's no, no, I know. <laughs> I know, but I mean, it is one of the things I've always found remarkable. I mean, you arrived in Holland and you, you, you learned Dutch immediately. It's sort of, anyhow, uh, it's something I, one of the many things I've always admired about you. Let me just a very a quick stab at uh, Sophie's question. I think I, I agree with everything Ayan just said, and I think I think everyone has a role in their everyday lives in order just not to, as Ayan says, not to fall into the the traps that are laid for us. Uh, I've come to the view that that you, you shouldn't demand kamikaze like acts of bravery from uh, everyone, but we can all speak up a bit more. We can all take a bit of a step forward. Uh, there are cases, Ayan knows well from America in particular, where just individual parents, for instance, have said, no, no, we're not having this at this school. When I'm not having you teach my children this junk, uh, this racist, divisive nonsense. And and it has a huge effect. And and they must be onto something because they get so when, you know, individual parents uh, stand up like that, they get huge attention. And if they were onto nothing, no one would care. Uh, uh, it's because they're on to a thing that so many people feel, a majority feel, I believe, but too few people speak up ab about. Uh, that's the reason why there is so much attention. But, but if there was more of that, and I, I think there will be, uh, then I think these are, uh, uh, these are winnable battles. Uh, I may have said before to Ayan, I mean, I, I, I've, I've fought many unwinnable battles in my life. I'm an expert in them, a uh, connoisseur, you might say. But uh, I, I, it means I know... I know a winnable battle when I see one, and I, I, I think, I think uh, on on much of this, it's a winnable battle. Um, yes. Now, Ayan, we, we we started four or five minutes late, and we're we're we're, um, we're just past the hour uh, here. Um, there's so much more we could talk about, and so much more I know that everybody with us this evening would love to hear about, and so much more I would like to hear about. Uh, will you promise me one thing before we finish, which is that whenever we're all allowed out of our seclusion and we're allowed to take the risk of sitting next to other spectator subscribers in a theatre and more than 30 people, do you promise that we can come back and do this in, uh, in real life, in real time, in real person? I promise to do that. And I promise to do it in the UK. 
<laughs> Fantastic. I'm going to hold you to that promise. I hope that everybody who's joined us tonight uh, will hold us to that promise. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us this evening. Thank you again uh, to the events team at The Spectator. Uh, most of all, thank you, Ayan. It's been a thrill as ever uh, to see you. I can't wait till that next opportunity. Uh, and until then, um, thank you and to everyone, thank you and good night.